Hello, everybody. Hope you guys are doing good tonight. This is uh, Thursday night, back into the book of uh, book of Daniel. Got an uh, amazing chapter tonight, Daniel chapter 8. And you guys have had quite the conversation in the chat. William H., are you getting them all stirred up? My favorite question from was from Mike MQ. How many disciples are in a dozen? Very good, very good. Uh, if you guys can see me okay, hear me okay, uh, let me know some way, shape, or form in the chat, five by five, or take your choice. Be creative. Just let me know uh, whether you can uh, hear me okay. It's kind of important. Well, maybe not, I guess, but uh, I see Norma Krause. It's good to see you, Norma. Hope you're doing well. Um, while you guys are chatting it up, I'm going to try to swing back by and say hello to everybody, but I know there is a lot of chat here. So if I miss you, I apologize. Uh, William H., you've got them all wound up, all wound up. Let's see. We got Love the Land every day. Good to see you. Thank you for, thank you for stopping by on this Thursday. Uh, we got my brother, William H. Good to see you, my friend. Hope you're doing well, brother. Hope you and Lily are both doing well. Lori's World, it is good to see you, my friend. Uh, Mike MQ, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Hope you and Mary are well tonight. We got our good friend, Pat Evans, says, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Let's see. Looks like looks like William H was running a trivia competition in the chat. That's very good. Uh, Chrissy Cat, good to see you. Hope you're doing well tonight. William H asked the question, "How many disciples was there?" You guys can feel free to answer that. Let's see. Who else we got in here? Uh, that's a deep one, William H., which is heaviest, five pounds of bricks or five pounds of feathers. Uh, Miss Dana B., good to see you. Hope you're doing well. There is Miss Lake. Says, good evening, friends and family. Yes, William is on a roll, Chrissy Cat. I have to say. I have to say. Lori says five pounds is five pounds. Be a lot of feathers. Oh, how many bakers are in a dozen? You guys. Uh, let's see. Miss Susie D., good to see you. Hope you're doing well tonight. Appreciate you, my friend. Mr. Charles Bushcraft family, what's up? Good to see you. Good to see you. There is our good friend, Mr. Eric. ER is good to see you. Appreciate you, my brother. We got Ragnar Adventures. Good to see you. Bubble Bibble, how you doing? Good to see you. Got Miss Norma Krause. Made it tonight. Good to see you. Appreciate you being here. We got Miss Lake sneaking back into the house. We got Beach Harming. Good to see you. Appreciate you. We got our good friend and our brother Carson, 1954. Good to see you. Appreciate you. Bushcraft says, I see and hear a Bigfoot. Let me grab the camera. Picture will go blurry. Got our brother Ross Bell. Good to see you, Ross. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Ross, I wanted to tell you, thank you for pointing out the, uh, the second born thing. Uh, that kind of blew my mind. I appreciate that. Very, very good stuff. Very good stuff. Mike says him and Mary are great. Very good. Let's see. Blake says been cold here for a week or more. On top, I got a notification it'll be colder the next few days. We're tired of the cold. Harvest Mary Moon, good to see you. We've got Miss Grape Jams. Hello, 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 family. Good to see you. We got Mr. Bill Bailey. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Uh, if you guys aren't subscribed to this gentleman's channel, another great brother in Christ, Bill Bailey. Uh, good stuff. Uh, Bill, I noticed a lot of the Berean theme on your channel. I like that. I really like that. Nice to have you with us. 
Let's see. If I missed anybody, I apologize. We've got my brother, Mr. Bubba News, says, Dig Deeper Ministry, the Holy Spirit is going to carry you through, brother. Uh, Bill Bailey, howdy, Dana B. And all his, he says hi to all his friends. Bubba's got lots of friends. Yep, saw Eric, yep. We got our brother, Mr. Vineyard Dad. Good to see you, my brother. Iron sharpens iron. Appreciate you. You guys had quite a good conversation going on. All right, I think that catches us up. And if I missed you, I apologize. That was a lot a lot of people to, to sort back through. Yeah, Carson and uh, his lovely, lovely lady with us. Um, Daniel chapter 8, uh, this is, um, again, it's it's one of those chapters in the book of Daniel that's just off the charts phenomenal in terms of its prophetic value. And if you're a, if you're a fan of just history in general, Daniel chapter 8, you know, last week when we looked at Daniel chapter 7, uh, chapter 7 gives you like a broad scope. Um, basically a framework um, of world history from the time of Daniel all the way up to, to, the, to the return of Christ. And within that structure, within that framework, uh, many of these next few chapters are going to be inside of that structure. Uh, the, and definitely Dan, Daniel 8 tonight, um, definitely going to be inside that structure. Uh, Cindy Squirrel, good to see you. Bonnie, good to see you. Appreciate you guys being here tonight. Um, one thing to note, um, Daniel 8, okay, Daniel chapter 2 through chapter 7, those, those chapters of Daniel were actually written in Aramaic. They weren't written in Hebrew. You, know, you, have, you have the book of Daniel, the Hebrew, but those chapters are written in Aramaic, because they're dealing with the Gentiles. It's the times of the Gentiles. You got Babylon, you got Persia, you got the Greeks, you got the Romans. There, there's a there's a heavy there's a heavy focus on the on the Gentiles. So those chapters, including chapter four, was which was Nebuchadnezzar's testimony himself, this pagan Babylonian king's testimony of our God. Uh, it's it's all it was all in the Aramaic language. That was that was the word the language of the world at that point in time. Well, things change when we get here to chapter eight. Daniel eight it, it switches back to Hebrew, and why would it do that? Why does it go through all those chapters with, with speaking in the Aramaic language, and now it changes back to Hebrew? It's because the focus starts to switch. It, these chapters moving forward from Daniel 8 towards the end of Daniel up to Daniel 12, they, they're not looking so much at uh, the Gentiles as much as they're looking at the Jewish people. Now, there's there's a focus sh shift here. Uh, so, the, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And uh, before we get going tonight, I, I want to point out something that you're going to see tonight. And, and we, we you see this a lot in Scripture. Um, one good example, what I'm referring to is dual reference prophecy, dual reference. You know, God is that good that, that he can do that. He, he can speak something through his prophet and it be true in that time period, you know, close to that time period of that prophet. And yet there be a far, like far in the distance, far in the future, full, a, a complete fulfillment of that. and and. Many times it's not until the end times, and we're going to have some of that tonight. We're going to have a, a big time dual reference prophecy uh, of uh, of someone that is referred to as a little horn here in this here in this text. And just for an example of, of dual reference prophecy, you know, in in the book of Isaiah, you have Isaiah prophesying about the king of Babylon. That's Nebuchadnezzar. You know, hundreds of years before he, he was in power, but Isaiah is prophesying about Nebuchadnezzar, and then it morphs. It's like that prophecy changes, and he starts talking about you walked in Eden, 
it, this this double reference prophecy it, it, it shifts from describing the king of Babylon to Lucifer. He, God does that in His Word through His prophets. Dual dual reference prophecy. That's what I call it, and a lot of people um, a lot of people refer to it as that. So if you ever hear that, that's what it's talking about. God is using a prophet to describe two events: one close to that time of the prophet, and one in the distant future. And we're going to see a an amazing example of that tonight. And it's 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 an example that he gives us in the form of a historical figure by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And we're going to be saying that name a lot tonight. You guys will remember that name after tonight. Antiochus Epiphanes. Lake says she can't say it. We'll just call him the little horn. <laughs> All right. So before we um, dig into this this amazing chapter tonight, we need to ask for uh, we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us through this. So I'm going to put text up on the screen here, and we're going to pray over this. Um, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead tonight. So if you would, pray with me. A ask, for, ask for guidance tonight. Ask for a revelation tonight. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. We thank you for uh, our brothers and sisters who have gathered here to dig deeper into your holy word and just to soak it in, Lord. And, and Father, as we as we go through these these amazing, amazing prophecies from your prophet Daniel, help us through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to to understand. Help us to see clearly, Lord. We have, we pray for a revelation that you open our minds, open our hearts, soften our hearts to to let your word in and and let it change us. Let it change us, Lord. Uh, be with us and guide us to all truth and all understanding through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you guys are here all the way to the end, I got something I want to talk to you guys about off topic. It's not a picture. It's not a picture. All right. So, again, Daniel switches back to the Hebrew language here. And in chapter eight, so so let's get going here. See what we can do. Daniel eight says the vision of the ram and the goat. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. So we got we to gotta break this down a bit as we go. It says, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king. So we know this is in, in the Babylonian kingdom. Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. So this is in the third year. I think Belshazzar reigned for 14 years. So this is uh, it's over 10 years before the, the Babylonians fell to, to the, the Persian Empire. You know, Babylon is still secure and in power. Okay. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel. So Daniel, again, has, has another vision. It says, I looked in the vision, and when I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. Now, that's so, sometimes that, that, that city name Susa can, can be translated as uh, Shushan. But you, you think about that, and that is the, if you, if you remember the book of Esther, you know, Esther married Persian king, right? That was Susa. That, that's where this that's where this was taking place. Daniel, he he sees himself there. Okay. Now remember, this was it was the, the Medo Persian Empire that conquered Babylon. And, and as we read tonight, a, a, there's a lot of repetition. There really is a lot of repetition in, in the book of Daniel. Uh 
this this prophecy it, it it not only looks past Babylon, it not only looks past the Medo Persians who conquered Babylon, it, it looks to looks to the rise of the Greek Empire. So this is well in the future. This is this is a very prophetic vision. It's it's many, many, many years in advance. Okay, verse 3, Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased, and magnified himself. So we have this, this ram with two horns, and all of these symbolic images that we're going to be reading here at this first part of chapter 8, later in, in chapter 8, it gives us the exact interpretation of, of, what the, of what these are representative of. And we find out later in this chapter that this ram with, with two horns is 100% certain the Medo-Persian Empire. And there, there's some interesting details. Uh, it says a ram with two horns. Okay, that's that's not too abnormal. Two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. You remember back at chapter seven, we had Daniel had this vision, and remember the bear. He had a vision of a bear, and the bear was raised up on one side. This this is referring to the exact same thing. You have the bear that was raised up on one side. Now you have this ram with one horn that's higher than the other. The, those being off balance like that, it, it's, it is a very good description of the Medo-Persian Empire. It says the longer one coming up last. The Medes and the Persians, it was actually the Medes who, who were the power at first. But the Persian Empire, they, they gained power and and they rose above the Medes. So that's it's a very good representation of the Medes and Persians. Uh, this not only the bear raised up on one side, but this ram with one horn uh, higher than the other. It's, it's without a doubt the Medo Persian Empire. Uh, the ram was very fitting in other ways also. And, and this is historical things that you can look up. You know, the, the national emblem. Persia is guess what? It was the ram. It was the ram. They, they they had rams on Persian coins. Even the Persian emperors, the, the, when they would go into battle, you know they they wouldn't wear a a crown with diadems on it. They they would wear they would wear a headdress of ram's horns. So God knows what He's talking about, even when He writes it hundreds of years in advance. Picture the, the, the Persian emperor, emperor wearing a headdress going into battle with these ram's horns on it. It, it, it fits perfect. It, it is the, ac the, the accuracy of this prophecy in chapter 8 is off the charts. It is phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal stuff. Okay, and it says, I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward. You know, it doesn't say anything about east. Persia had no major victories to the east. This is this describes them perfectly. West, north, south. And no other beast could stand before him. And if you want to take this even deeper, you could go back into the book of Isaiah and you could see where God called out Cyrus hundreds of years in advance, Cyrus the Great, to lead the Persians to take down Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. It's the, the prophecy is off the charts. Fantastic. We, we serve an amazing God. The, the, the details and accuracy in the prophecies of the book of Daniel, they without a doubt confirm the truth and the power in God's word. And there, there's never been anything written that was so accurate. There's, there are many scoffers who who look look at the book of Daniel and, and they just say 
there, there's no way that was written when it was written. Had to have been written much further in the future because the accuracy is perfect. It's 2 et accurate. But there's a problem with that because Jesus himself gives credence to the prophet Daniel in the book of Matthew. He's like, you want to know about the end times? You look back. You, you look back to the prophet Daniel. So they, they can try. They, they can try all they want to, to discredit God's word, but uh, that's a losing battle for them. That's a losing battle. Okay, verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat. So we had the ram with the two horns. Now we got a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Now, you remember in chapter 7, that, that vision that, that Daniel had of the leopard, that leopard that was so quick and could attack so fast. And not only was it, you think of how fast a leopard is, you, you could make, how could you make a leopard faster? You give it wings. And that's what he saw in the vision. He's describing the same thing, this male goat coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. This male goat is cruising. It's, it's a picture of the speed. And it said the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Now, we can pretend like we don't know what this, who this is referring to. Uh, but later in the chapter, it tells us exactly who this is referring to with, without a doubt. This, this male goat from the West it is clearly, clearly identified later in this chapter as Greece. This, again, the, sim, the symbolism, you know, just like the ram in Persia, the symbolism of, of, of the goat. And I, I, I highly recommend you, if you guys are history buffs, that you dig back into this. The goat is a perfect analogy for the Greeks. You know, the, the goat was a common representation of the Greek empire. Again, you look at their, their coins, you would see goats. 200 years before Daniel's time, the Greeks were called the goats people. I don't know why, they just were. No clue. God knows. It says, across the surface of the whole earth, this, this goat, he is cruising without touching, touching the ground. We know the goat's referring to Greece, and this goat that had a conspicuous horn between its eyes, that's referring to their, their king, their first king. It's referring to Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is pretty incomparable when, when you look at his military uh, conquest, his speed. Alexander the Great, he took he took the throne at age 20. And, and by the age of 26, he had conquered the Persian Empire. That's pretty fast. No one could keep up with the speed of Alexander the Great and his armies. He, he was a great, great general. And often outnumbered even. Some of some of the battles that Alexander the Great would lead his troops into, he would go up against three hundred thousand soldiers with a fourth of that and win these battles. Alexander the Great and his conquest are are legendary. And and you know, oftentimes in that same context, you know, the the folklore and, and things get added into it. So Alexander the Great and, and his legend, it kind of it kind of grew with that, but there is a historical basis for it. Um, he indeed he he arose from the west and he rose with great speed. Um, that notable horn, this conspicuous horn that's referring directly to Alexander the Great. It says he came up to the ram that had two horns. So Alexander the Great and the Greeks came up to the ram, and we know that's Persia that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal and rushed at him with his mighty wrath. Now, if you do any research into that, to, to ancient history and 
look into the the the, the major historic battles, you're inevitably going to stumble across the Persians and the Greeks and their battles. They did not like each other. They did not like, like each other. It says he came up to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal and rushed at him with his, in his mighty wrath. That just, again, it shows, shows the speed and power of Alexander the Great and his armies. Furious power that came against the ram. And like I said, some of the most fierce battles of ancient history were fought between the Greeks and, and the Persians. It, it is legendary stuff. It would keep going. I, verse 7, I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns. So the, those two horns representing the Medes and the Persians, they could, the Medes and the Persians could not stand up to, to the ferocity of Alexander the Great and, and the, the Greek army. And, and the Greeks conquered Medo-Persia. Six years from the time he took the throne at age 20 to 26, he conquered the Persians. I saw him come beside the ram and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him. And there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. And then we get some very important details because we, you know, we spent this time talking about the, the ram and the goat, but we're building up to something because the next session, the next section, it, uh, it refers to, to a very uh, interesting character. We know Alexander the Great took power, took the, took the throne at age 20 conquered the Persians in less than six years. Alexander the Great, he died at age 32, very young, very young. In, in 12 years, he conquered all of the civilized world. That, that's how great Alexander the Great was in his conquest. That is, that is speed. That is the leopard with wings. That is, that is the goat that would run and not even touch the ground. That's what, that's what God's word is referring to. But then it says, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. So that's referring to Alexander the Great. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. This, this is a picture of Alexander the Great. And in all of his might, all of his glory, all of his, all of his kingdom, his empire, says the large horn was broken. Alexander the Great died, age 32. His empire was split up among four generals. You know, some people say that the last words of Alexander the Great, they, they ask him, what, what, who do we leave the empire to? And whether it's true or not, it is recorded that Alexander the Great said, give it to the strong. What ended up going to four generals of, of the Greek Empire. Um, this is this is where it gets very, very interesting. Now I want to show you guys a map of this. This the Greek Empire after Alexander the Great died, it was it was split into four. I want to show you guys I want to show you guys a map of this. Just so you kind of get an idea of what we're looking at here. Okay, so you see the yellow. That's the Seleucids or the Seleucids. It depends on who you ask. So there's one. You have the Ptolemies. So this is basically the Egypt area. And then, let's see, that's small. You have Cassander over here, the kingdom of Cassander, which is Greece. And then you have Lysimachus up here. This is the modern-day Turkey area. So these are the four kingdoms that, the, that Alexander the Great's empire got broken up into. 
uh, Cassander with Greece and its territory, Lysimachus with it's Asia Minor, basically. It's modern day Turkey. And then Seleucus with Syria and note, note right here that this is Israel. And you notice the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, they meet. And this is this is gonna be this is gonna cause problems. It's gonna cause problems as as we look uh, later in the text tonight. Okay, let me put our scripture back up here. There we go. There you go, Bushcraft. There was a picture for you. And then there's your maps. Okay. Okay, so let's just re 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 reread verse 8 real quick. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon he was as he was mighty, that's picture Alexander the Great at his strongest, his empire at its greatest, a large horn was broken. Alexander the Great died. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns. So the one large horn is no more. Now in its place are four conspicuous horns, four smaller horns. Okay, then our, then our text starts to get very interesting, very interesting. Now, before we move on, I, I do want to point something out. Uh, Alexander the Great, not only was, was, he, did, was he militarily powerful, he, he, had, he had bigger goals than just dominating you know, the world. You know, Alexander the Great, he tried to take the Greek culture, Greek civilization. It was the, a passion of Alexander the Great to, to, to spread. Uh, oftentimes it's referred to as the, the Hellenic culture, the Greek culture, Greek civilization, the Greek language. Now, this is important. The Greek language. It, it's, that was not by accident. The Greek language became, because of the conquest of Alexander the Great, Koine Greek, which is common Greek. It became the language of the known civilized world. You know, God used this. God used this. Now, how did God, why did God use this? He used Alexander the Great and, and this Greek influence on the world, the Greek language, Koine Greek, to begin the preparation uh, of getting the world ready for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel came in the Greek language, right? It was written in Greek. And this was because of Alexander the Great's influence, his power. You know, Koine Greek became the, the common language of the civilized world and is the language of the New Testament. Not only that, Koine Greek, they, they took the Old Testament and translated the, the Hebrew into Greek. That's the Septuagint. There's no coincidences with God. The, the Greek language was the language that God wanted his word in for a reason. For a reason. No coincidences with God. Okay, so keep going. We go to verse 9. It says, out of one of them. That's referring, we just back up. It says, in its place there came up four conspicuous horns, and out of one of them, so out of one of those four horns, came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. This, the, the descriptions that we get through this text it clearly, clearly identifies the historical fulfillment of this little horn. The, the, the descriptions and the historical records, they, they match up uncannily. The, this little horn, it's referring to Antiochus IV, who 
gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes. We'll talk a little bit about that name a little bit later. But we get a great deal of insight, a, a lot of insight. When, when we look into this little horn, we look into Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. And it says, and towards the beautiful land, this rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. The beautiful land, that's referring to Israel. So this little horn certainly has some type of of connection with Israel, and it's it's not a, it's not a it's not a good connection. Remember where the Seleucid and and the Ptolemy kingdoms came together. That was basically Israel was basically a buffer ground between the two when it was hotly contested. You know Israel was heavily contested territory, and battles between the Seleucids and the the. Ptolemy dynasties, they were ongoing a lot. You know, the Seleucids, they gained control over Israel's in the day of in the days of Antiochus III. So Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, his his father actually gained control of, of Israel. There's there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history um, to this text tonight. Uh, one thing to note about this this little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, he he was not the rightful heir to the throne. So he, through treachery, through smooth talking, through bribery, he gained the throne. Not only that, but through murder, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, he murdered his own brother, and, and to gain the throne. This this is this is who we're looking at. Verse 10, it says, it's referring to this small horn. It says, it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. That, that language um, grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth. Uh, that, that language, it's, it points to not, I, th I think it's beyond pointing at just Israel. I think it's believers, God's people. A Antiochus Epiphany, as we're going to read, uh, some of some of his persecution against God's people is uh, it's horrendous. It is horrendous. Verse eleven, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and we know who the commander of the host is. It's God Himself. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. We know that's that's the temple. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. There's some deep scripture here. You have this this small horn, this little horn that it, that is growing fierce against God's people, against the beautiful land, against Israel. But you you get down here to verse twelve. It says, "On account of transgression," this is referring to the idolatry, the the the, the wickedness uh, of the, not just the Jewish people, but it's it's. I think it's referring a lot to the the Jewish leaders that they were in full blown apostasy apostate this apostasy at this time so that's and on account of that on account of the transgression the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice this this is because of Israel's sin that's the reason for this it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. The little horn will perform its will and prosper. It's it's tough. It's tough scripture to read. Uh, it's you know, imagine Daniel getting this vision. You have this little horn who we know is Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the fourth. He, he gave himself 
He gave himself the title of Epiphanes. He, he didn't earn that, or the people didn't give him that title. He gave that to himself. Epiphanes means illustrious. You know, he's basically saying Antioch, or yeah, Antiochus, the god. You know, he's giving he's giving himself the, the an air of deity. Which is what this what this text is saying, and even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, now the Jews, they didn't really refer to Antiochus the Fourth as Epiphanes. They, they they changed it up a little bit. They actually twisted his name to Antiochus Epimenes. And Whereas Epiphanes means illustrious, Epimenes means madman or crazy man. And that's, that's how the Jewish people referred to Antiochus Epiphanes, which very good description of him. <coughs> Let's see. He magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. Now, as we're reading this, we're reading these descriptions of Antiochus Epiphanes and the things that he has done, the magnifying himself and persecuting God's people. You you should start a, a picture should start coming into your mind of something something else in the Bible, uh, perhaps from the Book of Revelation. It's this dual reference thing that we're going to be looking at uh, tonight quite a bit. But Antiochus Epiphanes, he so accurately fulfilled. The, the, this prophecy that we're looking at tonight, uh, that the critics say, no, that can't be real. You know, that that the prophecy that Daniel wrote it had to be written at a much later date. It's too accurate. They they just it, they they can't they can't believe that it, that the prophecy is that accurate, written that far before. Like I said, but Jesus gives credence to this prophecy. Matthew twenty four. He's Look at look at Daniel. He refers back to Daniel. So you have Antiochus who exerted his power to the south, east, and Israel. So we can read that. He murdered and persecuted the people of Israel. Caused some of them, the host and some of the stars, to fall to the earth. He blasphemed God commanded idolatrous worship. He, he exalted himself. <clears throat> he put a stop to the temple sacrifices. He says it removed the regular sacrifice from him. Antiochus, he refused to allow the Jewish people to, to offer sacrifices in the temple. He, he basically tried to squash out every part of, of Jude, Judaism. He tried to remove it. He tried, he tried to eliminate it. He desecrated the, the temple and opposed God, and, and it says he's, he prospered. Antiochus brutally, brutally persecuted the Jewish people. And along the way, he was forcing Greek, Greek culture and Greek customs upon them. You know, they, the, the Jewish people, they didn't want that. Antiochus was forcing it upon them, you know, using murder and violence to, to bludgeon them into this. They, the Jewish people didn't have much of a choice. They either conformed. No, I'm, I'm using these words carefully. The, the Jewish people, I want you to picture this. The Jewish people either conformed to, to the demands of Antiochus Epiphanes to, to give up, give up their worship of God or die. You, that should be ringing a bell and reminding you of, of someone else in the Bible. In December of 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes and his brutal persecution of the Jewish people, it, it escalated to a fevered pitch. 
after he had just been defeated in battle at Alexandria. You can, you can picture this, the, the rage in Antiochus Epiphanes being defeated in battle. He ordered his generals to seize Jerusalem. Uh, and they, they did this on a Sabbath. They, this was planned. This was on purpose. Once Jerusalem, he had Jerusalem under his control, he set up an idol of Zeus. And, and he didn't just set up an idol of Zeus. He put it in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. And, and I even cringe even thinking about that. I just think about the wrath of God. So Antiochus sets up an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Antiochus further desecrated the temple by offering pigs as a sacrifice on the altar. You know, pigs were considered unclean. And not only did he offer the pigs on the altar in the temple, he took the pig's blood and, and sprinkled it throughout the sanctuary. He, he desecrated God's temple. At that point, Jewish sacrifice in the temple stopped uh, because the temple had been desecrated. Even if they were able or, or wanted to bring an offering, the temple was desecrated. It was unclean. This was a absolutely brutal time to be alive for, for the Jewish people. Now, there are a couple historical books that you can, you can read quite a bit about this, this time period uh, of this, this brutal persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, you guys have probably heard of the book of... Uh, First Maccabees. Um, First Maccabees is actually in the Catholic Bible. Um, it's not in the 66 books of, of our canon, but and, and it's not considered an inspired book, but you can get a lot of great historical information out of, out of First Maccabees. You get a lot of insight into how Antiochus persecuted the Jews. You get insight into his his blasphemies. You know there are records, and it, there aren't exact numbers, but by some records and some calculations, Antiochus Epiphanes is responsible for murdering over a hundred thousand Jewish people. That's that's the, that's the level of brutality that we're looking at here, hundred thousand. Now, I want to read some, some text from 1 Maccabees because it, it's, it's really good historical stuff, and you, we learn a lot about that time period. So I'm just going to read through some of this. It says, And after two years fully expired, the king sent his chief collector of tribute unto the cities of Judah, who came unto Jerusalem with a great multitude, and spake peaceable words unto them. Now, catch that language. He's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Came unto Jerusalem with a great multitude, and spake peaceable words unto them. That, that should be ringing a bell with, with, with other texts, specifically Book of Revelation. It says, But all was deceit. For when they had given him credence, he fell suddenly upon the city and smote it very sore and destroyed much people of Israel. And when he, had, when he had taken the spoils of the city, he set it on fire and pulled down the houses and walls thereof on every side. But the women and children took they captive and possessed the cattle. Then many of the people were gathered unto them, to wit, every one that forsook the law so that they committed evils in the land and drove the Israelites into secret places, even wheresoever they could flee for succor. Now the 15th day of the month 
Tazlu in the in the hundred forty and fifth year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar. It's it's referring to the not only the idol the the idol of Zeus, but also that uh, offering of the swine on on the altar. It says and builded idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side. Antiochus Epiphanes tried to to eliminate eliminate any trace of the one true God. He he, he put idols and altars everywhere. It says and burnt incense at the doors of their houses and in the streets. And when they had torn in pieces the books of the law which they had found, and they burnt them with fire, Antiochus Epiphanes tried to eliminate God's word. And whosoever was found with any book of the Testament, or if any committed to the law, the king's commandment was that they should put him to death. You listen, you follow God, you worship God, you will die. Thus did they by their authority unto the Israelites every month, to as many as were found in the cities. Now the five and the twentieth day of the month they did sacrifice upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God. At which time, according to the commandment, they, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised. Again, you, you can just see this. He's trying to snuff out the Jewish people. He's, he's trying to, to eliminate Judaism. It says, and they hanged the infants about their necks and rifled their houses and slew them that had circumcised them. That's a that is a harsh time. That is that's persecution. It says moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. He's, 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 he's trying to eliminate the Jewish heritage and make and force them into. Hellenic or Greek in, into the Greek civilization. It says, and everyone should leave his laws. Everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. Hmm. And sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple, and they should that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and the holy people, set up altars and groves. And the groves were where they there where they would go to worship pagan deities and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and pro profanation. To the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king he said he should die. That is persecution. That is persecution. This, this Antiochus Epiphanes, I want you to think about everything that we just read, everything we just we just found out about this Antiochus Epiphanes. He slaughtered a hundred thousand Jewish people, tried to completely eliminate Judaism, every 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 written record of the law. You couldn't you couldn't even have God's word. But we also see here in verse 12 that's up on the screen, it says, and on Count of transgression. 
the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Because of transgression, the, the Jewish people, especially their leaders, they, they were in full-blown apostasy during this time period. Bad place to be. This, this whole entire scenario, this whole entire historical event, Antiochus, the persecution, the, the desecration of the temple, This picture that we get is a picture of, of the end times. This is a picture of the end times. And we're going to see that later in this chapter. This, this isn't just a, a, a little blip in history. And we're going to see it. Let's, let's keep going in our text. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking. So, so Daniel hears an angel speaking. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? We already found out that the sacrifice ceased. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking. So this is a conversation between angels. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? How long is this going to be? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy placed, holy place and the host to be trampled. How long is this going to be? The, the, the temple's desecrated. How long will this, will this last? Verse 14, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Now, this verse 14, oh boy, this, this has been debated, this has been argued, this is, this is, uh, this verse 14 it is a, a springboard for all kind of crazy things. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know about a few of them. You know, you know first, so let's look at probably the proper way to look at it says, he said to me for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Now, 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, to me, when I read that, 2,300 evenings and mornings, that makes me think 2,300 days. To me, that seems like the logical place to go with that. Some people think... For 2,300 evenings and mornings, you count an evening and you count a morning. So you would have to take that 2,300 and cut it in half because each day there's an evening and a morning, which would make it 1,150 days. Okay, there's, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting thing that happens in either scenario. Both seem to fit with something pretty important. 2,300 days or 1,150 days. First, we, 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 what are we trying to build to when the holy place will be properly restored? We know that we know that day. We know when the, we know when the temple we know when the temple was rededicated and cleansed. We know it. We know the date specifically. We know for certain that the date the temple was finally cleansed, was December 25th, 165 BC. Rock solid. We know it. December 25th. Yes, that's Christmas Day. I'm waiting on somebody to put Hanukkah in the chat. Because that, that's what it's referring to. Hanukkah is the celebration of that. The cleansing of the temple. That's where Hanukkah comes from. December 25th. So if we use that date... December 25th, 165 BC, and just start working backwards. If we go backwards 2,300 days from that date, it brings us to 171 BC. And what happened then? 171 BC is when Antiochus Epiphanes began his persecution of the Jewish people. 
kind of fits, right? Kind of fits. Okay, so what if we what if we say it's the 1150 days? What happens if we take that same date, December 25th, 165 BC, and work backwards? If we take it back 1150 days, we end up at the time when Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. They both fit. They both fit. But this 2,300 days, evenings and mornings, either way you look at it, whichever start point that you're looking at, takes you to the same place. That's when the holy place will be properly restored. That is when it, it got to the point, and I think from, from everything that I've studied, the, the people, specifically the Maccabees, they got to the point when, when they saw that abomination and, and in the Holy of Holies, that statue of Zeus, they, they, just, they weren't standing for it anymore. And there, were, there was a rebellion. There was a rebellion against the Greeks, against Antiochus Epiphanes. And ultimately it led to a restoral of the temple, a cleansing of the temple. Now, and I, I, I'm not trying to offend, I'm not trying to offend uh, anybody here, uh, but I, I, I just want to point something out. This 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the holy place will be properly restored. This, this verse has given birth to, to, and I'll do, I'll air quote, movements, movements that are, um, well, some of the, the movements that are, that, that have sprung forward from this 2,300 are quite frankly, tr kind of tragic. I guess that's putting it bluntly. You know, I think anytime you, you try to, you try to pin down the exact day that Jesus Christ is returning, like to the day. The Bible says no man knows the day or hour, right? But there are, there are a couple movements that came out of this. Verse 14, he said to me, for 2,300 more evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. There was, a, there was a gentleman by the name of William Miller, and he took this, he took this verse 14, and he took this 2,300 evenings and mornings, which should be either days or cut it in half days. I mean, that's, that's, where, that's what the text is saying. But he took this he took this prophecy and he took to 2300 days and he's like no those aren't days that's 2300 years that's 2300 years he took 2300 years and he plugged it in to another prophecy that we're going to learn about next week Daniel 9 Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy William Miller took 2,300 years, and he went back to, it was a decree by Cyrus the Great to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. We know the date that that decree uh, occurred. His theory was, from that day, Cyrus's decree to rebuild Jerusalem you add 2,300 years, and then the holy place will be properly restored. His thought was the holy place is this earth, will be restored, because Jesus will come back. If you do all that math, and you add 2,300 moving forward from the date of Cyrus the Great's decree, you come up with the year 1844. I don't know whether you guys have heard heard this prophecy before, but 1844, this was the birth of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. You know, the movement of Ellen G. White, 
it all started with William Miller. 1844 came. Jesus didn't come back. They changed it to 1845. Jesus didn't come back. That was that was a dark time for a for a lot, lot of people. Very dark time. They thought they had it figured out. 1844, he's coming back to cleanse the holy place, to cleanse the earth. It didn't happen. It is an unfortunate and it is a, a tragic misapplication of, of scripture. It's not the only movement that's come out of this. The Jehovah's Witness movement. It's also sprung forth from, from this verse, from this prophecy. Now, can we know without a doubt that this 2,300 year slash day theory is wrong? Yeah, we, we, we can know from scripture. This 2,300 year day is, is absolutely incorrect. How do we know this? Because we know that the, the holy place was properly restored. It was cleansed. Well, how do we know that for certain? Well, I can show you. If you go to the book of John in the New Testament, John 10, 22, it says, At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. This is Jesus attending the feast of the dedication at the temple. This is basically confirmation that the temp temple had been cleansed already. There wasn't 2,300 years, year days. It, did, it didn't make sense. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That, that, that prophecy, the holy place will be properly restored. That prophecy was written I want you to think about this. Now, this wasn't written a month before Antiochus Epiphanes. This was written 350 years before Antiochus Epiphanes. That is prophecy of our God. He wrote it down to the day, 2,300 days. Then the holy place will be properly restored written 350 years in advance before Antiochus Epiphanes was even a thought. Phenomenal prophecy. Phenomenal stuff. Okay, we move to verse 15. So we've worked through, the, Dan, Daniel has related the prophecy, and now we get the interpretation of the prophecy from these from the holy ones from actually from gabriel himself see we kind of cheated earlier verse 15 when i daniel had seen the vision i sought to understand it and behold standing before me was one who looked like a man and i heard the voice of a man between the banks of the uli and he called out and said gabriel Give this man an understanding of the vision. That is really, I find that fascinating. You have, remember, you have the two holy ones speaking. And then you have one of the holy ones saying to Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Help, help him to understand this. So he came near to me where I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. Daniel couldn't even stand before Gabriel. He fell on his face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. So, so, so here we are. We just went through all of this historical stuff with Antiochus Epiphanes and, and his persecution, his desecration of the temple, that, that abomination of desolation he set up in the temple and how it how it, it it fit this prophecy so well and it's but then Gabriel says understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end 
Antiochus Epiphany is a picture of someone much more sinister, much more sinister. Everything that everything we we learned or we 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 draw out from the historical accounts and tying Antiochus Epiphanes with this prophecy, it's a picture of something of the end. This vision refers to the time of the end. End times. This is dual reference prophecy. Partial fulfillment at that time period and a future complete fulfillment. Antiochus Epiphanes is a very, very good picture of the coming Antichrist. From what Antiochus did to the Jews in his day, we have a glimpse of what the Antichrist will do to them in the future. It is a picture of what's going to happen. Okay, verse 18. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Dual reference prophecy. Everything that we thought Antiochus Epiphanes fulfilled in this, which he did, which he did, was just a picture of what's to come at the end. Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes is a picture or a shadow of the beast, of the Antichrist, of the end times. Gabriel goes on to give the identity of the ram and the goat. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Alexander the Great dies. Four generals take over the four kingdoms, they which will arise from his nation, not with his power. It was split. It was fractured into four pieces. Verse 23, in the latter period of their rule. Now, as I read through these next few verses, specifically 23 to 26, I want you to think about how they fit with Antiochus Epiphanes. But I, but I also want you to think about how they would fit perfectly with everything we know about the Antichrist of the end times. Okay, you think place this in both, in both, dual reference prophecy. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. Mm. The vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. The prophecy of these verses, 23 to 26. They are equally true of Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist. It fits both. A near fulfillment, and I say near, 350 years from the time of the prophecy, Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and fulfills that near fulfillment. The far future fulfillment with the Antichrist is yet to be fulfilled. It's, it's still out there. 
You think about both Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist. Both have these fierce features. They both understand sinister schemes. They, they, they gain strength through their cunning. You know, Antiochus Epiphanes was a smooth talker. He was a cunning man, evil. The Antichrist, he comes in with peace at first. You know, he confirms a covenant with the many. Cunning. Smooth talkers, both. It says the power shall be mighty, but not by their own power. Both Antiochus and the Antichrist were empowered by Satan. It says they shall prosper and thrive. It was true of both of them. The Antichrist will prosper. It says he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Shall destroy mighty men and the holy people. Both will destroy their enemies. Antiochus did. The Antichrist will. Both brutally persecute the Jewish people. The holy people. It also says, he shall cause deceit. He will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. If we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. It's referring to the Antichrist. Revelation says that the beast gave his power unto the Antichrist, or, or the, the Satan gave his power unto the beast. The dragon gave his power unto the beast. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. If we go back up, it says he will magnify himself in his heart. Picture this magnification of himself. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says, Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now you think about Antiochus Epiphanes. He put a statue of Zeus, an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. The Antichrist, it says, he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Antichrist takes it to that next sinister level. We also learn let's see says, he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? I'm hoping some people can put that in chat. Who is the prince of princes? He will oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agencies. Both of these Antiochus Epiphanes, he was broken without human agency. What is, what's that mean? Antiochus Epiphany, he didn't die. Nobody killed him. Antiochus Epiphany, he died of a disease. He will be broken without human agency. This also applies to the Antichrist. We, as humans, mankind, will not break the Antichrist. We will not destroy the Antichrist. Revelation 19, 19 to 21, it shows the, the death, the, the defeat, the destruction of the Antichrist. It says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. I saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies. 
they're they're going to go. Remember, it says he even what they say exactly. He will even oppose the prince of princes. He he goes to battle against Jesus himself. He assembles his army. Verse twenty, and the beast was seized. There wasn't there wasn't even a fight. The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Broken without human means. Jesus Christ is the one who, who destroys the Antichrist. You remember the stat, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, his dream of the statue, those, those, the, the toes, the iron, the toes of iron mixed with clay, that stone that wasn't cut by hand, that stone struck that statue right on the feet. That's pointing to that final Antichrist kingdom. Both Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist broken without human agencies. Now, last verse in Daniel 8 says, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Why, why would Daniel be sick for days? I'd say likely... Um, it was due to him learning of, of the suffering his, he was shown his people were going to suffer. This was, this was enough to make Daniel sick for days. He, he saw the, the reign of this little horn, the persecution, the desecration of, of, of Daniel's people. But there's, there's something really important that this chapter closes with. You know, oftentimes we get wrapped up in prophecies. We get, um, yeah, we get, we get so, we get so wrapped up. I mean, I want you to think about Daniel here. He, he was just given this vision from God and he was floored by this. It, it was given to him by, by Gabriel. He was in the presence of, of Gabriel to get this. He fell on his face. It was, it was a prophecy regarding persecution beyond imagine of his people. Daniel was exhausted and sick for days. But I want you to look what Daniel did. Did, did Daniel let this prophecy of this, this future tribulation period did it, did it just break him and ruin him to where he couldn't function? Or, or there's a message here. It says, then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. You know, a lot of times we can't completely grasp some of the things that, that are happening in the world. Sometimes we, we, some of the things that we see going on in the world, they make us sick. But, but through all of that, are, are we carrying on the king's business? Are we carrying on the king's business? I think that's, that's very important. Carrying on the king's business. What is the king's business? King's business is the gospel. It is the gospel. Through through all of it, through all of the persecution, through all of the tribulation, through through everything, everything this world can throw at us, we got to carry on the king's business. The gospel. The, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You want to be about the king's business? It's the gospel. It is the gospel. I love that. I got up again and carried on the king's business. The 
if we look at Revelation 1 3, it says, if you look at 827, I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. If you look at Revelation 1 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. You think about that time back in Daniel's time period. The, the time wasn't near for him. The time is near now. The time is near. The, the prophecies are being unsealed. Revelation 22.10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. All of that time where, where Gabriel told Daniel, this is, this, is a, this is a prophecy of times of the end. Revelation 22.10, do not seal up the word of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. That is us. That is us. So we know that the time is near. Are we about the king's business? It's a big question. It's a big question. All right. Uh, that was Daniel chapter 8. Now, we're going to close with that. And then I want to present something to you guys. I already did it once on the channel, on the community tab. But uh, starting Sunday nights at Sunday nights at eight, um, I, I I'm going to start something that I was I, I think I'm going to call it uh, Dig Deeper Home Church because I can't think of a better name for it. But anyway, I'm 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 I, I'm going to set up a Streamyard backstage. Now some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Like right now I'm on Streamyard. I'm live. Uh, there's a chat that can see us, um, but as soon as I click the end stream button, I just go backstage. You guys can't see me anymore. If I have guests up here, they come backstage with me. We can chat back there as long as we want. Sunday nights at 8, I'm going to have um, a backstage, and I want to bring some people up perhaps that that don't get to participate much um i had a couple people reach out that they're interested um i mean i, I know a lot of you guys in the chat from what you type but i've never talked to a lot of you guys face to face uh, but it would be nice i think if you guys are interested in being part of that uh, you can send me an email it's digdeeperministry at gmail.com just send me an email, and Sunday night before before eight o'clock, I will I will email you back the link. All you gotta do is click it. If you have a a, a camera, that's that that's preferred. Um, but if you don't want your face to be shown, that's okay too. Before clicking the link, they have to close out of all any and all other apps and whatnot. Yeah, but it's backstage. It's not live. Right. But you would explain that yeah, and there'll be they there will be bugs and there will be glitches and there'll be learning periods. I understand that we all we all go through that. We all expect yeah, nobody's nobody's going to get in trouble. Um, but yeah, if you guys are interested, email me and, and we'll save you a place. I got room for I think I think I can do me plus nine, so ten people we could do backstage. I think it would be very cool. Sunday Sunday nights 8 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, starting this Sunday. This Sunday. Uh, yeah, so let me know. All right. Uh, yeah, bring snacks, Bushcraft. <laughs> uh, wow, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. And, and uh, I guess one other thing I want to just close with real quick people see some of these prophecies different um i get that i get that some people see the the 
the little horn that comes from the four horns as not being uh, as possibly even being Rome. You know, they make that connection. That's okay. Uh, the main thing is what we closed with tonight being about the king's business. You keep the gospel as the num keep the main thing, the main thing. Be about the king's business. We'll fellowship through the rest. We'll fellowship through the rest. All right. Uh, how about a quick, quick close with prayer? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. Uh, we thank you for the, the phenomenal prophecy that, that you've laid out for us in, in your holy word. Lord, we see this these prophecies jumping off the pages in our in our daily life. It seems more and more each and every day that the prophecies are being revealed to us and, and unsealed. Lord, throughout all of that, and in all of all of the the talk of prophecy and talk of things to come and the persecution that is prophesied and the antichrist that is prophesied through all of that lord help us to keep our focus on you help us to keep our focus on you we're not looking for the antichrist we're looking for jesus christ so, Lord, help us, help us to, to be about your business. Help us to spread the gospel. Uh, give us power and strength through the Holy Spirit. Give us the words. Give us direction. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Appreciate all you guys. Sorry that ran so uh, long tonight, hour and a half. Uh, next week, next Thursday night, um, I don't think I can do chapter nine in one night. I'll probably have to bust that up. Chapter Daniel chapter nine is, in my opinion, my my opinion, the the most phenomenal prophecy in the Bible, and that's saying a lot. Daniel chapter nine is something else. Daniel's seventy weeks prophecy. I don't know that I can, don't know that we can get through all that in one night. We'll, we'll see how that goes. We'll let the Holy Spirit decide that. All right. Uh, hope you guys have a great night. Um, Lake says bye. Or not. I said Lake says bye. Oh, that's okay. Love you all. God bless. And we will see you Saturday. Yep, Saturday night we're going to be live on Lake's channel at 8 o'clock. Saturday night, 8 p.m. Eastern with uh, just some talk and Bible trivia again. And I believe Friday night Bushcraft has guests. Bushcraft always has good lives. True Yeah. Ooh. All right, we love all you guys. Uh, God bless everybody, and we'll see you soon.